Preparing for an AI future might be the most important challenge of today. But teams were already struggling with innovation, and now people are confused and skeptical and anxious about what AI might mean for the future of work. I know that the people who use technology will outperform the people that don't. It's my job to make sure that your AI transformation does not fit. It's my job to help you blend the power of technology with the power of human creativity. Teams have trouble figuring out how to reinvent the behavior that they've taken for granted for the last 25 years. Dan Chuparkov teaches, elevates, empowers, builds from a place of vision and creates impact. I've tried experiments for the last 10 years. I know what works and what doesn't. Um, I'm prescribing specific roadmap for change that I've done, I've done all these things myself. In the next five years, regardless of what our role is, what team we sit on, or what industry we sit in, AI is going to change the way we think about work. Most teams are focused on innovation and change, but it's not about their own behavior change. It's about the new product that they buy or the org chart flipping around. Innovation is just a noun, and it's the thing that results from some other actions. And I believe the actions are, you have to learn new stuff, you have to try experiments, you have to share information more efficiently, you have to make decisions faster, and you have to technify some of the manual work. So you'll, you'll start to look at the world in a different way. You'll start to find things that you can reinvent to make better, changes that you get to pick. I want you to think of AI like this too. It's a, a thing there that's helpfully suggesting things you might do next, and that will accelerate the way you get stuff done. I have something which I call the hierarchy of human expertise. And this is gonna be super important as we figure out what our relationship is with technology over the next 10 years. Just focus on the bottom layers of work and give as much of that over to the robots as we can. We create a partnership between us and the AI assistants that help us. Then we get to do the higher value stuff at the top of this pyramid. We get to flip the pyramid of work. AI is just the new way we make software in the world now. AI is just a new way we collaborate as people with the information around us. And if we do that, we will spend more time creating amazing new things in our industry, things that wouldn't exist unless we make the time to do this. Things that won't exist unless we harness the power of artificial intelligence. Uh, I help some of the world's most innovative teams uh, build some of the world's most disruptive products. I've been doing this for a pretty long time. I've had the fortune to work with a lot of very big teams, and it's pretty awesome. Um, and so I'm, I've learned some things along the way in the last 20 years, and I'm going to bring some of those to you today. Um, so we throw around words like disruption uh, pretty often in tech, especially at a conference like this. Um, and one of my self-proclaimed jobs in the world is to help people start to really, really, truly understand words like this and what they mean and what makes something disruptive and not disruptive. When you say artificial intelligence, I want you to understand what that really means. When you say words like big data, I want you to understand what those things really mean. So uh, today we're going to talk a lot about disruption, and so uh, we'll dig into that now. I have a, a pretty long backstory with uh, disruptive software, and it goes all the way back to uh, when I was first getting started. So in high school, I had a drafting uh, elective class. It was really awesome. I loved drawing. I just, it just made sense in my head. Um, and so I took a bunch of drafting electives in high school and then went off to be an architecture major in college. While I was in college, I got an internship at an architecture firm, and there were 50 architects all around me, and I worked with one at a time and learned about what they did and, and what they didn't do. And one of the people in that office was uh, working in a very, very unique way. And it's because of this disc here. And I'm totally dating myself uh, by showing this one because this has a date on it. And it, it came out in 1987. This is the disc for AutoCAD version 9. Um, and, and two, this floppy disc, which some of you have never seen in your life. It's actually like the original app store. Like we went to a building and got this. 
Um, and so uh, this, <laughs> this floppy disk is important because it was the first version of AutoCAD that worked on an IBM PC. So you didn't need specialized hardware. It took the, the price point of computer-assisted design and brought it way down to a $2,000 computer plus the license of this software. And that, that was pretty disruptive in the industry eventually. At the time, in 1987, not a lot of those architects that I worked with realized that. There was one guy who was shoved like in the back room somewhere. Like He had this plotter that would like draw, um, draw on huge sheets of paper and it made tons of noise. So he was like literally shoved in a back room with a door. Um, it was dark and it was cold. And, but it, it, was, it was really cool because I saw him able to make designs like this. This was sort of like the, the sample design file that came with AutoCAD 9. And all these other architects are saying, like, you can barely do anything on that machine. It doesn't have the capability to do real architecture. Um, but I, I learned it, and I, I was like, this is going to change this whole entire industry, right? Those of you that know anything about architecture now know that like computer assisted design is the way you do it. Um, and not a lot of people saw that. And at this moment I realized I don't want to be an architect. I want to be a I want to be a guy that makes software that can do that to an industry. And um, and so I, I did that, and then now it's like 25 years later. Uh, and the last thing we're going to talk about is disruptive teamwork. Uh, when you have a great idea, especially in software, because it's so easily rep reproducible in a slightly different way, um, other people are going to jump into your space and try to com compete with you. And, and so it's critically important as you try to build disruptive product ideas that you have a team that can out-execute the other people also trying to do it. Um, so can you build it better and faster than other teams? Um, and there's two ways I'm going to talk about that here. Uh, and, and the first thing is understand that the idea by itself isn't really that valuable. Um, people often think, I have this idea, I'm afraid to tell it to anybody because I don't want somebody else to steal it. Like, you can call up any random company and say, I have this idea, will you please build it for me? And I promise they won't just like take your idea and then just start building it. Like, getting a company to do something for you is really, really hard. Also, uh, it's not about the idea. It's about the execution of that idea. Let me go back to self-driving cars for a second. A lot of companies are trying to do this right now. Maybe all companies that have anything to do with cars and some that don't have anything to do with cars trying to make self-driving a reality, right? And it's going to be about the long, the long tail of solutions to this problem, like the plastic bag flying through the air problem, right? There are lots of things you have to get right. It's not about the MVP of self-driving cars, right? That, that has nothing to do with anything. It's a great first start, but you're not the winner in a space because you were the first to an MVP. You are the first to deliver the long tail of challenges in that space. Then you become the winner. Um, and so, uh, one, focus on that long tail of challenges and make sure that you and your team are executing uh, with, uh, with disruptive scale on the whole breadth of the solution when you get well beyond your MVP, because that's where, that's where it really starts to make a difference. The next thing that's critically important is the way your actual team collaborates together. Um, and so I do a lot of talks on, on teamwork. There are uh, already a bunch at, uh, on, on the internet uh, that I've spoken on before. I'm going to talk about one thing today with respect to great teamwork uh, because I feel like it's, it's emerging rapidly and I think it's going to be critically important. And so uh, tell, tell me, what you can just yell, what, what is this person doing? Looking at a screen. Looking at a screen, yes, slightly more specific, or maybe maybe less specific. She's she's working, right? So she's this is what a person looks like when they're doing work, or she might be browsing Facebook. You can't really see the other screen. Um, but this is what it, this is what it looks like when a person's doing work. What are these people doing? Meetings, Meetings right? They're not doing work. They're talking about work. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it looks like when a person's doing work. This is what it looks like when people are talking about work, right? First, I want you to understand the difference between those two things. If we drew a value stream for your week, right, that, that orange line in the center when you're actually making productive stuff for your consumers, um, and then we drew all the other distractions and other things that you're doing, like, I want you to understand that percentage. Are you doing work 40% of the time or 20% of the time or 80% of the time? Know those numbers and be critically, uh, 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 pay attention to it critically. Um, the, the second thing I think here that's, that's really important is um, as you are trying to collaborate as a team like that, 
Um, no, nobody ever, none of your customers ever says, man, I love that company because they have the best meetings. And nobody cares about your meetings. It's about the value that you're delivering. And often these days, especially with teams like us, we're building software as our output or building hardware products or building services. And all of those things, that's the real value for, the, for your customers. So make sure you're focused on the value part of the work and you're minimizing the non-value parts of the work. Um, and as you do that, what you're going to find is that there are new ways of collaborating emerging. Um, how many of you here are using a product that lets you do chat at work with other people? All right. Awesome. Um, right, chat is an emerging uh, form of micro communication. That's way way better maybe than email because it uh, people are inclined to write much shorter messages and they write them frequently, a lot closer to the need of the communication. And those things are great, um, but it's it's still it's still a disruption from your work. Like when when your designers here, when you're working in Photoshop or Sketch or whatever you do, uh, and you then stop doing that to chat in Slack or Slack or whatever chat you use and read a bunch of messages, you're, you're still disrupting the work, it might even be worse because you're disrupting that work much more frequently and it takes time to get back into the swing of, of what you're doing. And so uh, that's an important thing that's emerging. Chat is a great way of communicating on Teams. But there's something else that I, I, I just discovered recently. So um, I think that everything you need to know about collaboration you can learn from Fortnite. Um, now I'm going to tell you how I, how I discovered that. I, I, uh, I have two 17-year-old twin boys, and they do 17-year-old twin boy stuff, and one of those things is Fortnite. And so I'm sitting in my office uh, at, house, at my house working one day, and I hear Dalton, one of my kids, playing Fortnite in the other room. This is actually Dalton. Uh, they're twins. Graham is the other one. Uh, and he's playing Fortnite, and he, right before this moment, he said, hey guys, hold on a second. I'm going to drop for five minutes and go get some more supplies. I'll be back. Meet me by the waterfall. Um, and so he said that, he disappeared, everyone else kept doing whatever you do in Fortnite. Um, and then he did his own thing for a little while and came back and caught up with the rest of his group. Um, what he didn't do is say, hey guys, in 15 minutes, let's go over by the waterfall and have a meeting, right? And then they all left and then went off and tried to collect scavenge or whatever you do. He didn't do that, right? He's just in the meeting constantly. It's hard to tell with the, with the screen here, but that's headphones. He's talking to his team constantly. And so I tried this with one of my development teams, um, and it was actually kind of amazing. So we have a very distributed team. We have people in lots of cities and lots of countries. Um, and so I, I, I just we just got a, a conference room for the whole week, and we started a conference line, an open conference line in the middle of the day, in the middle of the morning, in the middle of the room, and kept it open all day. And so as we were working, we said, hey guys, I'm about to start this thing. I was thinking of doing it this way. What do you guys think? Is that a good idea? Everyone said, yeah, that sounds fine. Or somebody said, wait, no, don't do it that way because then that's going to break this other thing. And then we just all worked for a little while longer. And it was, it was essentially chat, but audio. And audio, your brain has the ability to process audio in a less disruptive way. We could also just put our headphones on and listen to music for a while when we wanted to, to ignore the chatter because we were focused. But when Dalton is in the workforce, six years from now or whenever, uh, right? He's going to be used to just having online communication with his team going all the time because he's been doing it for 10 years, right? He's been talking with his um, teammates constantly and he doesn't let that interact, in, inter, uh, it doesn't let that interrupt him from the task he's actually trying to execute. And so what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is find ways of maximizing the communication on your teams but without stopping and starting the work over and over and over again. Because you will be competing against other teams that have found a better way to do this. And so when there are eight teams out there all trying to execute on your singular idea for changing the world, the team that has the best collaboration is going to quickly start outpacing the other teams. Um, so I, I will close with uh, this one statement. I think we talked a lot about stuff. We talked a lot about picking the right products. We talked about having fresh perspectives and ideas. We talked about using things like data science and, and neural nets and other technological accelerators. Um, but the first product you have to build is a team that can build products. When you go to a venture capitalist and ask for $5 million, they don't even care about your product. You're going to change it anyway. You're going to pivot. Almost everyone does. Right? What they really care about is the team that you have right? and what they can, how they're going to be able to execute. And so before you do any of those other things, make sure you have the team part right. So 
That's it. I think those four things, remember, perspective, scale, accelerators, and teamwork. Those are the things that I think you need to build great products in the world. 